You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we just want to take a bath in peace in Fab Facts. It's important we do absolutely nothing in the randomizer. And it's my turn to interview writer, director, and novelist Stephen Gallagher. Oh, another rest for me. That's all coming up in Pod One Four Six of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. <sighs> Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Are you enjoying your time off then? Oh, it's so nice. It's like a lovely yeah, little must be. holiday. It is. <laughs> is it? Oh, bless. Well, that's the closest thing shorts? to realism. No, uh, my shorts. And your little, your little uh, sleepless t-shirt. And my bum bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, great. Or as the Americans say. Oh, don't. Fanny don't. pack. Oh, you did. Mm. Uh, <laughs> right. <clears throat> Well, that's got things off to a good start, hasn't it? Oh, so childish. Anyway, look, I, <sighs> I uh, with the fanny pack, and Jamie Anderson, and that bloke there with the bum bag is... Richard James, and you're joining us for the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Yeah. Number 140-something. 146, uh, which Wowzers. explains why over there, mm. in the distance, Chris oh, yeah. Dale is there with a chisel carving into the brickwork. What is that? Yes. C? Yeah. Uh... Uh, uh, what, 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 C, what, C, C, L, C, 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 D, L, C, D, L, three, V, one, th- yeah, that's one, right. V, v, one, C, D. Anyway, anyway that's the, uh, yeah, that's very he's good. Doing it in Roman numerals. Oh god. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. He is. Yeah. Yeah. It's been good. A long yes. day already, uh, yes. hasn't it? <laughs> I know. We've already just begun. Uh, you're listening to Jerry Anderson podcast. Please, can I tell our listeners what's coming up? Please do. While I have a drink and a rest. <laughs> well, we've got all the usual fun and games, of course. We've got Fab Facts coming up, no doubt, in just a minute. Oh, we've yes. got some newsy, news, news, news from the oh, Jerry Anderson yes. universe. We've got uh, ah, an interview that I did with writer, director and novelist Stephen Gallagher, a name very familiar to lots of you, I'm sure. Yes. We'll talk, be talking a little bit more about him later and to him a little bit later on. And, of course, Chris Dale, once he's put that chisel down, will be joining us to bring us his latest randomizer, whereby he sits down in front of a random episode of a Jerry Anderson series to give us his thoughts and comments. Oh, and yes. Last but not least... Oh. Yes. By no means least, we'll be hearing from our wonderful Podstrons. That's you, ah. our listeners, who have been emailing in their droves to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. They've been posting on our Facebook group and they've been tweeting us and uh, also posting on YouTube. So I'll be reading out some of those comments a little later on. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That oh, all yes. sounds oh, yes. oh, absolutely yes. amazing. Well, yeah, doesn't it? And obviously you'll all be sorely disappointed, uh, Podstrons, as you listen on through. <laughs> well, it's that sort of fading. <laughs> the they, I think they start with a degree of optimism, and yeah. then you can feel it kind of ebbing away yeah. as the podcast progresses yeah. towards its inexorable end. <laughs> <laughs> towards the heat death of the universe. Uh, that's certainly what this feels like. Anyway, uh, yes, I'm yep. looking forward to all that, but I'm looking forward to nothing more than fab oh. facts. Right, okay, go on then. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Fab Facts is the segment of the show where I have a book of Fab Facts and I flick through the book of Fab Facts, Richard shouts Fab at a random point, which means I stop flicking and then I read you out a Fab Fact from that page and Richard will pass his judgement as to whether that fact is Fab or not. Are you ready, Richard James? Born ready. Are you ready, Podsteron? Yes. Glad to hear it. Uh, So here we go. (laughs) Fab! Oof. Hmm? Ah, where are Ooh. we? Well, when are we? Let's not be too cheery because there's a rather sad start to this particular fab fact. Oh, as it deals with someone who passed away back in November 2020. Oh. Uh, that person being the late great Des O'Connor. Oh yes, yes. For those of you with fanny packs. By which I mean, probably not in the UK, Bumbags. maybe in America. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Des was uh, an English singer, comedian, entertainer, one of those all-round performers who always seemed to have kind of been there and seemed like he might yeah. go on forever. 
Yep. He is probably best known to Anderson fans, though, for a sketch from the Des O'Connor show, which ran throughout the 60s and into the 70s, that you may have seen on DVD releases or on YouTube, possibly, Mm -hmm. in which he plays a man haunted by various Stingray vehicles and characters while taking a bath. (laughs) I see, right. (laughs) (laughs) It's a bit of an odd one, but... Did you know, Richard James and dear Podstrons, that this sketch was actually directly responsible for getting somebody else a role in an Anderson production? Really? Mm-hmm. Not a rubber duck? Uh, <laughs> no, no, not the rubber duck. So it wasn't Des, but someone of the same era whose career ran rather along similar lines of comedian and game show host and all-round entertainer. Oh, all right, my love. Nice <laughs> to see you. To see you. Nice. Right. No? Almost. Well, rather than talk okay. about it ourselves, shall we mm. let that person explain in their own words how that Stingray sketch got them a role in the movie Thunderbirds Are Go? Oh, yes. Here we go. I did the voice for one of the characters, that of Brad Newman. Why was I so honoured? Well, I'd gone to the studios to seek Jerry's permission to have the giant stingray fish jump out of Des O'Connor's bathwater between his knees. And after he'd agreed in a rather preoccupied way, he explained that the actor he'd hired to play one or two roles in the film, the late Alfred Marx, had pulled out due to a disagreement about the fee. Then he looked at me shrewdly and said, how much would you charge for the job? I said, Jerry, I'd do it for nothing. And that was the first time I ever heard the phrase, the price is right. Well, there's a voice from the past, eh, Richard James? Oh, wow. The one and only Bob Monkhouse, with whom I had a Chinese meal once. Anyway, let's go on for the rest (laughs) of the fat fact. Again, possibly not a name that well known outside of the UK, but over here, rest assured, Bob Bob Monkhouse was a pretty big name at the time and remained so throughout the rest of his career. Now, the Thunderbirds Argo movie began filming in March 1966, and obviously the voice tracks would have been recorded before that, but we don't exactly know when. Hmm. Stingray would have been old news at the AP Film Studio by the time the sketch was shot, so always mm-hmm. assuming Bob's recollection of events is accurate. So there's a chance that the Des O'Connor sketch might possibly have been the last footage shot with Commander Shaw and the Marina Puppets. So double fab fact oh. there for you, Dickie. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Does that make the commercial canon? <laughs> Can we put it in the... Uh... Uh. I mean, in the Stingray timeline? I'm, it's got to be, surely. I'm not sure that uh, Desert Connor <laughs> in the Bath te- technically nope. fits with the whole world of Stingray. Oh, on. What, one of Titan's uh, monsters? Uh, I mean, yeah, probably not. <laughs> well, okay. But yeah, it's a nice thought. Called it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> you've got to be Aquafibian. Mm. No. Uh, okay. Oh. Well, what a lovely Stingray and Thunderbirds are go and Des O'Connor in the bath. Uh, fab fact. I mean, you don't. Well, yes, they don't come along often, do they? <laughs> it's very rare that we get anything like that on Fab Facts. So, uh, thank you, Book of Fab Facts. Thank you, listener. And that is the end of this week's bath. Yeah, it's facts. Oh, I went for oh. bath. Oh, mm, interesting. You went for bath. I went for yeah. Des. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, wait, what let's is call so the whole lovely thing off. is that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's not a bad idea. Is that so many big names associated with Jerry Anderson, either on the periphery there in a commercial, or, you know, we've got the lovely Nicholas Parsons and, uh, you know, all the stars, even as far as uh, your, your, your Koenigs in, in Space 1999, your Martin Landau's, and your, your, all the big names have been associated at some point, uh, myself included, with the Jerry <laughs> Anderson production. I mean, you being <laughs> the biggest. Of the names, I mean, <laughs> the of course. Is. Oh, phew. Yeah. There's a bit of a pause there, and I wondered what you were going to say. It must have been a delay on the line. <laughs> it must have been. <clears throat> now, before we go any further, Jamie, you'll be delighted to hear that just before we started recording, I went onto our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Botstrons, and I told them that I was going to be talking to you at any moment. And did they have anything they'd like me to ask or tell you on their behalf? So are you ready for a few questions? Can't wait. For example, Roger posted, I've just finished the CD version of First Action Bureau. Mostly enjoyable. Oh, sorry, not mostly enjoyable. Most enjoyable, he says. Oh, that's a relief. Uh, yes. Phew. Lots of questions left to answer, which is as it should be. But one that comes to mind is from the interviews after. Mm. What is the Zero X that Richard worked on? Oh. Well, Roger, you must have missed that. How could you possibly have missed that, Roger? Yes. Yes. Well, go on, Dickie. Take it away. 
Well, this was an animated and uh, voiced uh, edition, I suppose, of, a, of an old comic strip from uh, A Planet of Bones, isn't it? I think That's it was, uh, that uh, Chris Thompson designed and um, has lots of uh, Anderson voices in it. Uh, Wayne Forrester and Robbie Stevens, I think, as yes, well. Yes, indeed. Yes. So that's available on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, yeah. I believe. Just search so, still. Zero X Motion yeah. Comic, Roger. Easy. Oh, there you go. Rebecca asks, any more First Action Bureau in the pipeline? Sorry if this has already been asked. Uh, yes, there certainly is, and that's all we can mm. say for now. Hmm. Tom says, who would make a better voice for your sat-nav, Sergeant Zero or Parker? Ooh. Yeah. That's a tough one, it? actually. I would probably go for Zero, actually. Yeah, I'd go for Zero. It's Definitely. a bit harsh, isn't it? On, barking yeah, at me. Uh, there's something about yeah. that, yeah. I wouldn't be barked at. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> fine. Uh, Callum says, a bit off-brand, but I know you'll both be interested. If you could decide who would play the next Doctor Who, oh. who would you pick? Hmm. I'll tell you what, let's broaden that out. Let's say, or rather confine it a bit more, and let's say, who from the Jerry Anderson universe would you have play the next Doctor Who? L- a living or dead? Living or dead. Oh. Yeah. Because I know who I'd choose. Well, who would you choose? I'd choose Barry Morse. Oh, of course. Of course you would. Of course, of course. Yeah, that's a great choice. Yeah? Um, Anyone else you can think of? Yeah, I don't know. That's really mm. difficult, isn't it? Um, mm. I mean, Ed, Ed Bishop would be kind of cool. Yeah, he would. Uh, really right. different, and obviously, uh, you know, yep. American accent as as the Doctor. Yeah. Oh, that's yes. my doorbell. I'm so sorry. Oh, for goodness sake. Who's there now? Back in a sec. That's probably my agent. Yes, they're just after a larger percentage. Oh, dear. Right. Hello. Hello, is that your Tiger King DVD box set just arrived? <laughs> I know you know, you're a fan. You know, I went there, didn't you? But did you? Yeah, but way before it was famous. Right. I went to Joe Exotic's place. I met the guy with the, the no legs. Right, and, yes. Um, I met the baboon and got weed on by a liger. I mean, it was an amazing Great. trip. Goals. Yeah, life goals. Anyway, are we <laughs> are we carrying on as if think nothing had happened? <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, there's a yeah, yeah, why not? Okay, yeah. great. Carry um, on then. So, uh, well, Robert finally says, "How about you two sing happy birthday for the 28th of March?" Hmm. I'm not a great. I'm not in great I mean, voice today. And also, that was like a couple of days ago, wasn't it? Yesterday. Oh, go- uh, so, gosh, yeah, you're so right. It's been a gone, I'm afraid, Robert, so too yeah. late for that. Anyway, that's all for now, but I'll have some more Q&As for you next week, I'm sure. And coming up a little later on, I'll be reading out some Facebook posts, some YouTube comments, and some emails. I look forward to those things. Brilliant. Yeah, I thought you would, yeah. Well, uh, Richard James, uh, in the mm-hmm. meantime... While we wait for that, should we pass the time by having some Jerry Anderson news? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Mm, okay. Right, it's that bit where we talk about some news from Jerry Anderson stuff, isn't Otherwise it? Otherwise known as. The Jerry Anderson News. News, news, news. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, no, What? Good. Come on. Anyway, Richard, as you know, <sighs> coming up on the 14th of April is... Oh, so exciting. International Jerry Anderson Day uh, on yeah. what would have been Dad's uh, 92nd birthday. Goodness me. I can't right. believe that. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, we've had our first Jerry Anderson Day partnership announcement. And of course, that's with the lovely chaps and chapesses at Network Distributing. Uh, yeah. Network, who uh, famously restore all sorts of archive Anderson goodies and other non Anderson goodies uh, in glorious HD, are putting on a very special HD Jerry Anderson Night In on their streaming platform, uh, which oh. you can find at watch.networkonair.com. Uh, now, okay. that evening is approximately five Earth hours of Jerry Anderson goodies, all features in HD. Now, oh. there are some things there which I'm not guaranteeing, but, um, well, I am guaranteeing, have never been seen in HD before. So that's right. quite cool. Mm-hmm. Also featuring uh, newly created content, unheard archive, and all sorts of other goodies in between. It's going to be rather fun. So you can pop yeah. along uh, from the 14th and uh, and watch that uh, t- as many times as you like. I think it's 4 99 But in the lead up to that... The return of something even more special, or as special. What? Right. Yes. Fab <gasps> Live. Oh, at last. <laughs> Lots oh. of you have been requesting it for some time. We haven't done one Absolutely. for ages. When did we last do one? In September, was oh. it? Or, uh, yeah, I think earlier, it was. I think. Yes. We did a lockdown mm. Fab Live. Mm-hmm. Um, well, 
we will be doing a fab, fab live from 5 30 p.m uk time on wednesday the 14th of april for 90 minutes what i know that will wow i, I, I should have run that by you first before saying that <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. it's 90 minutes uh, it will feature okay. special guests competitions giveaways cool things i'm hoping Fable to con- fib. a fab fib yes i'm hoping yeah. to convince uh, chris thompson to build a mole kit in real oh. time in the 90 minutes and we'll keep checking in with him nice uh, and we'll just do some general prep for seven o'clock when we okay. would like you if you want to to log on to watch.networkandair.com and start watching the jerry anson night in at 7 p.m and we will be tweeting along live so we can oh. all have a lovely watch along together and enjoy an Anderson night in. So you may want ah. to take your take some time during Fab Live to make sure you've eaten, make sure you've got snacks and drinks ready for yeah. the evening, uh, and yeah. then sit down all together and enjoy, well, nearly five hours of uh, of Jerry Anderson content. So um, if wow. you do have an early start on on Thursday the fifteenth, apologies because you may well be up till midnight, but I think <laughs> it'll be worth it. Uh, can I then, uh, Jamie, at this point, just put out a call mm. for people to get in touch? Fab live at jerryanderson.co.uk. Because, as usual, we'd love to feature some of your uh, contributions. Send us your pictures of your, your Thunderbirds models or your uh, toy collection or your cosplay. Uh, send us your recollections of meeting Jerry or uh, comments about your favourite programmes. Send them all in. Fab live at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll feature them on the night. Yeah, lovely. And if you're going to be uh, yeah. joining us, then make sure that you uh, tweet us with the hashtag, hashtag jerryanderson day and now i believe that due to territorial restrictions if you are in the us or possibly even just anywhere outside the uk i'm waiting for confirmation you may not be able to access networks platform Uh, not networks Uh fault it's the way that licensing works however you won't be left out because there are other partnerships still to come and be announced there will be things for you as well so you mean this is just the beginning this is only the beginning (sighs) s-i-g Uh, as uh, the late Frankie Matthews said on the CGI Captain Scarlet test. Anyway, Richard James, there's other cool stuff going on right now. And in fact, one of those things, (laughs) yes, there actually is, uh, is a design collaboration with a rather lovely designer from Manchester. Oh, yes, who's that? Gail Myers Co. Now, Gail is based in Manchester. She is a pattern and surface designer and a Jerry Anderson fan, and she has created some rather delicious... You can't eat them, but they look delicious. Uh, delicious Jerry Anderson control panel inspired mugs. Uh, these are great <laughs> retro modern designs, uh, super limited edition, set of four, uh, based on loads of 60s Anderson control panels. You'll definitely recognize some elements and colors in there. She's done a beautiful, beautiful job. Sets of four, uh, limited to 250 sets worldwide. That's it. And we'll be doing some more collaborations with Gail in the future because she's a great designer. It's a really lovely look. So if you want some sort of subtly Anderson stuff in your mug collection or mug Mm -hmm. cupboard or wherever Mm -hmm. you keep your mugs on a mug tree, Mm -hmm. then these may be the ones for you. They are rather lovely. And I have already ordered a set for myself. Uh, oh, rather selfishly, yes. Yeah, right. So you, actually, you haven't ordered 250, have you? No, no, there's there's 249 oh, right. left after this one. <laughs> but they're, yeah, they're really, really lovely, and we hope to do more with Gail in the future. Uh, now, you can go and follow Gail on Twitter. Right. I'm just looking up her Twitter handle because I've forgotten. Oh, well, it's obviously yes. at Gail Myers Co. Now, uh, Gail, G A I L Myers Co. M Y E R S C O U G H. But that's not Myers okay. cough because that would be no. the incorrect way to say her name. But a good way of remembering it. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. if you want to follow Gail Myers Co. at Gail Myers Cough, uh, yes. <laughs> if that helps yes. you to remember, it certainly helps me. Now, uh, lots of you, as I mentioned in the Fab Live uh, tease just now, Chris Thompson will hopefully be making a mole kit live on fab live on the 14th of april in the evening there okay, but uh, that's only one of 11 different kits that have been released by backman and aip hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you have bought kits and are already starting to make them which is Whoa. very very cool lovely. we've sold out twice of the kits but they are back in stock again so if Great. you want to grab yourself a thunderbirds kit there's thunderbird 2 uh, and thunderbird 1 hangers obviously thunderbird 1 thunderbird 2 thunderbird 3 thunderbird 4 and a thunderbird 5 Fab mm. One, um, Fire Flash, and the Mole, and um, and a transparent Thunderbird too, so you can see all the innards and all the stuff inside the pods. It's very cool. 
Uh, if you nice. are making that, do email us podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. We would love to see your builds underway. Yeah, make sure you get the glue off the uh, off your fingertips though before you email us, because otherwise you get stuck to the keyboard. <laughs> There'll be yeah, so very careful keys stuck to your fingers. <laughs> yeah. And finally, for this one from me, Chris Dale has been busy beavering away. He's always beavering, isn't he? Oh yeah, he's just... a big beaver. <laughs> we <laughs> should just no. call him the beaver. Uh, Chris okay. has been writing busily on the Jerry Anderson website, and there's a rather fascinating article. Funnily enough, I've just mentioned Ed Straker not long ago, but mm. the unexpected journey of Ed Straker. Um, right. which is a really lovely exploration of all things Ed Straker from UFO, so I think you'll probably enjoy that one. Uh, right. And Chris is very busy producing all sorts of great content, uh, video and written stuff, uh, and of course the randomizer. I mean, how does he fit it all in? I've got absolutely no how idea. How does he fit it all in? He Keep must lead a double good life, work. doesn't he? Oh, uh, that yeah. must be it. Maybe there's a clone. Yes. Anyway, we'll That'll find out. We will investigate and we'll report back here. But pop along to jerryanderson.co.uk to have a read there. There's probably some other stuff that I've missed out, but there's so much excitement about Jerry Anderson Day, I can't think of anything else. So, No, fair enough. For now, whew, that brings us to the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Jerry Anderson Day news. <laughs> and other also and, news. Yeah. Yeah, and more to come on Jerry Anderson Day. That's amazing. Well, oh, we'll have more every week for the next couple of weeks, I think. Lovely. Now, people have been emailing us in at podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk, and I have okay. some emails here, which I'm now going to fire your way. Ooh. This one was in the subject heading was cash, exclamation mark, and it's from Paul Hyder. Paul says, hi there, guys. I was wondering, which of Jerry's series do you think has made the most money over the years? Did any of them lose money? He says, love the podcast. Been with you since episode one. All the best from Paul Hyder. So which of Jerry's series has made the most money over the years? Well, uh, is it one of the I'm, older ones? Because of I mean, it's you know, terribly vulgar to talk money, isn't it? <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that sort of thing over here. Uh, well, it's almost undoubtedly Thunderbirds, isn't it? I mean, you, yeah, you just have yeah, to look at the number so. of repeats, the number of merchandise lines. I mean, I wouldn't want to put a number on it. It would be nearly impossible. But yeah, um, yeah. that is certainly viewed and has always been viewed by uh, anyone who has held the rights to it as the jewel in the crown of uh, the yeah. Jerry Anderson universe. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I would think probably that would be 10 times the next runner, which might then be Space 1999, possibly, ah, or could be really? Scarlet or Stingray. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Thunderbirds. And any of them lose money? I mean, I doubt I doubt that ever happened, did uh, it? Well, there's some interesting accounting on a couple of the shows. I mean... Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, certainly. Obviously, a pilot, for example, like the investigator, oh, sure. loses money as such, yeah. as in, you know, it doesn't make its budget back. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Crossroads to Crime, famously, was pretty close mm-hmm. to not earning its budget back. But I don't think any of them will be will be kind of proper loss-making projects, um, certainly yeah. not anything that's a complete series. But there you go. Yeah. Yeah, great. Bernie says, hello, I don't know if anyone has suggested this already, but I would like to recommend Robert Meyer Burnett as a future candidate for a podcast interview. He's an American YouTuber and filmmaker, and on his channel, he's expressed his love for Space 1999 and the toys based on the show and UFO. I've sent a request for an interview with Jamie on Robert's site as well. Well, that's very kind, Bernie. So okay, well, he, we'll he is a regular regular suggestion by Podsterons across oh, the oh. internet, and Rob and I have been speaking on and off for a few years anyway. Okay. He's just a busy guy, and so mm. t- finding time to get him in has been a bit tough, but he's certainly Great. on the wish list. Great. Hannah's been in touch to say, Hi, Richard and Jamie. How is everyone? I'm still doing fine. As I'm writing this message, I'm working on a new Anderson-themed drawing, which is nearly complete. And she says, keep an eye on the Podstrons Facebook page. She says, I want to share my own newsy news 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 for you all. Uh, For a long time, I've been a member of St John's Ambulance. And recently, I volunteered to support the local vaccination centres in my free time. I don't do very much work. I just keep the seats clean for the patients and make sure everyone knows where they need to be. I mean, that sounds pretty vital to me, Hannah. Mm. She says it's a very small job, but it helps ease the stress for the NHS staff so they can focus on their work to get the vaccination programme rolling as much as possible. And they're always very grateful. I'll be helping as much as I can. FAB, Hannah the Artist. Oh, well done, Hannah. Hannah, I that mean, that's is great. True, yeah, true to the spirit of Jerry Anderson, I would think. Don't you think? I absolutely think so. And uh, Hannah... If you are listening, send an email to support at jerryanderson.co.uk and say, Hi Louise, Jamie said I deserved a prize for being so great. 
and um, wow. we'll send you a little something, Hannah. So just make sure you send your address as well, and we'll we'll send you something over. Well done, you. Fantastic. Well done, Hannah. And finally, Steve says, "Hi, chaps. Speaking of celebration days, with the first International Jerry Anderson Day coming up on the 14th of April, and with Thunderbirds Day being 30th of September, Space 1999 Breakaway Day being 13th of September, how about a special day for Space Precinct?" <laughs> he says, "I'll throw my hat into the ring with the 8th of August." Oh. I get eight it. Eight of the eight. Precinct 88. I, I get it. Nice, yeah, nice. He says, uh, how about a special day for each of Jerry's shows? Over to you, Podders. All the best, Steve. Well, well I like that. 8th of August. We are sort of working on that. If you bought yourself mm. a Jerry Anson calendar for this year, uh-huh. if you skip ahead to July and look at the 10th, you may see a little mention of a special day for another special show. Um, I'm sure lots of you can guess which one it is, because 10th of July (laughs) tends to crop up quite a lot in that particular series. Yeah, interesting. Mm. But yes, we're open to any other suggestions about potential days. 10.10 for Terrorhawks Day, obviously. 13th of September for Breakaway Day. 30th of September for Thunderbirds Day. 10th of July for this other day. Uh, 14th of April yeah. for Jerry Anderson Day but what other suggestions do you have we would love to hear from you please drop us yeah. a line podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and I shall read out your emails next time I look forward to all that great <laughs> Richard yeah I don't feel like you've done enough work yet this podcast so can I oh, give you a bit more to do please oh go on then what do you want me to do sweep up uh, well Make if you could do that cup of tea. during the interview but also if you could ah. do the interview would that be alright Yes, of course. Well, let me tell you about this. So many, many years ago, in the early 90s, I had a very small part in a show called October that I think was shown on ITV here in the UK, written and directed by one Stephen Gallagher. Oh, yes. Now, you might know Stephen from his work on Doctor Who, uh, stories such as Warrior's Gate and Terminus, I think. But also, I mean, his name is connected with so many popular mainstream uh, British sci-fi such as Bugs and uh, Chimera and The Eleventh Hour, a real breadth of experience, uh, also a novelist and a director. And uh, I was lucky enough to convince him to set aside a little bit of time back in January for a bit of a Zoom chat about his career and his thoughts on the Jerry Anderson universe. Would you like to hear it? Oh, I'd love nothing more. Go on then. Here's Stephen Gallagher. Part one. I don't, to be honest, Stephen, know where to start with you, really. Screenwriter, director, novelist. Where are you most at home, do you think? It's really hard to say. I mean, I I was thinking about this the other day, and I've always been a bit of a dilettante in that, you know, I've kind of been like a kid in the sweet shop. And everything (laughs) that thrilled me as I grew up when I was a kid is what I've wanted to do. And I've got to say, you know, that after all this time, I've kind of managed to do it. I've never made, you know, I've never worked on a big movie, but I have written and sold screenplays. I've done... Loads of work in telly. Usually every time I do something in TV, I have to reinvent the wheel straight afterwards because I work in in that kind of grey area, which isn't one particular genre, yeah, but which kind of belongs to fantasy, stroke, thriller, stroke, you know, all that weird stuff that uh, that I grew up on in the 60s, all kind of, you know, swirling around in there. Yeah. And it's unclassifiable. And so I've never really carved a single reputation in any field. And the way that you make it big and the way that you make a lot of money is to um, is to really find one thing that you do well that's popular and then just do it again and again and again. Yes. And that to me is, is kind of my, my definition of hell, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I started off doing this, turning hobbies into, um, into professions, really. I, I was doing radio plays with my mates when I was working at Granada. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, uh, and doing them with the uh, with the guys from the local radio station up the road, and we were all in it as a kind of you know communal thing. It was like community theatre, and we got it onto the air. Yeah. When I started doing TV, I started with Doctor Who. Yes. Which is you know once you join the Doctor Who family, you're in it for life. Absolutely right. <laughs> it never leaves you, and you never get away. And I'm still doing it now after all these years. And then when I started writing. In prose, I, um, I I worked in the same area. I started publishing science fiction. Quickly realised I didn't know enough science, and this was just <laughs> around the time when uh, Greg Benford um, published a book called Timescape. Ah, oh, yes. And it was a really, really hard science fiction novel in the sense that you know the the science in it was really, really kind of cutting edge and, and adventurous and solid. And I couldn't do that kind of thing. You know, I was in the 
I'd come out of the Doctor Who camp. It was the kind of science fantasy camp, and that was going out. But you know, fortuitously, this was the uh, the late seventies, early eighties, and um, Stephen King was huge. Yeah, and I hugely admired Stephen King. And you know, I think all of us young writers in the late seventies, early eighties, we all wanted to be Stephen King, and he created a genre for us to uh, to be in. Yeah, interesting. All of that kind of collapsed in the um, in the late eighties, early nineties. You know, and you could see that all the publishers withdrew their um, their horror lines, and you could. Whereas at one time you could go into a bookshop, and all the novels in the most prominent display areas were uh, were horror novels. It became you could just find Stephen King, James Herbert, maybe Dean Koontz at the back, mm-hmm. and that was weird because horror movies really took off around that time just as horror literature died and around that time i got my first big break in tv because doctor who was a break but yeah. i was you know i was a young writer on the team putting my stuff in getting it rewritten seeing it made grouching about the the changes that have been made to my material and um with chimera in 1990 which is based on a book i'd written in 1980 Mm-hmm. Um, I broke into TV in a much bigger way because not only was it based on my novel and I did the script, but yeah. you know it was it was a project that I was all over, and that gave me a good launch. And then you know I went on to work on Bugs, which was a kind of cut down James Bond for TV, which <laughs> uh, which I absolutely loved, and did other projects on the side and had a stream of novels throughout the um, throughout that decade. So I mean I've, I've had kind of you know. The three act structure of my life has been kind of building up to um, to being a, a TV writer and novelist, being a TV writer and novelist, and now being this experienced old warhorse who uh, <laughs> gets invited onto podcasts to talk yeah. about their, yes their career. Yes, uh, yes where, where were the seeds sown, though, Stephen? If you can put a finger on a moment uh, in your childhood or as you grew up, where were the seeds sown for for what you were to become in life? Do you think? Two main areas, and we're on the Jerry Anderson podcast, and one of them was <laughs> you know, the uh, the whole kind of oeuvre of Jerry Anderson and um, the output of ITC in the 60s. Ah, yeah. And the stuff that either imitated ITC or contained something of that vibe. So, yeah. you know, I would put the Bond movies in with ITC because it was the same kind of sensibility on the cinema screen as, yeah. as on the TV. Stuff like Adam Adamant, which was basically the BBC trying to do its own version of an ITC series yeah. and producing something weird and bizarre and quite delightful in its own way. Yes. And it was weird, Adam Adamant, because apparently they used to shoot it on uh, video and then transfer it to 35 millimeter film to edit it. Right. Which is crazy because it means you get the worst <laughs> of all possible worlds. You get, That's right. You get yeah. the expense of 35 mil, but you get the crappy quality of um, 625 line black and white video. But of course, a great performance from Gerald Harper as Adam yeah, Adams. yeah, and um, you know, and a batshit crazy um, yeah. concept as yeah. well. You know, an Edwardian adventurer frozen in ice and uh, and revived in the swinging sixties. Yeah. I mean, wonderful. Yeah. Apparently, Kim Newman told me that um, the original intention had been to do a reboot of Sexton Blake. Ah, um, the um, you know the, the Edwardian detective, the Office Boy Sherlock Holmes, yes. which was another kind of preteen obsession of mine. I got into, um, I started reading the Sexton Blake books from, I, I bought them in paperback secondhand from a stall in Eccles Market. And in the <laughs> back of them was, if you're a fan of Sexton Blake, you know, why not join the uh, the Sexton Blake Society? You know, the Blake okay. article in the Collector's Digest. Yeah. And so I sent off for this magazine, the Collector's Digest. And it was the house magazine of the Old Boys Book Club. And this was all old guys mainly, you know, some women as well, but mainly old guys who'd read, you know, the Marvel and the Gem yeah. and you know, the all the Frank Richards stories in their in their childhood. And they were now kind of the age that I am now, reliving their childhood through this magazine. And I was this 11-year-old who wrote off and subscribed to the magazine for a couple of years. And it was the old, you know, classic fancy mimeographed and, uh, and hand-produced and hand-typed and, yeah, and, and everything. Yeah. And um, they used to have small ads in the back. So there I am with my little collection of Mayflower paperbacks of uh, Sexton Blake. And to them, I added old copies of the Union Jack from the 1920s and old copies of um, 
the Dreadnought and Boys War Weekly because it ran a Sexton Blake story in the back from 1915. <laughs> and, and so I was actually getting this kind of um, deep immersion in quite a broad popular culture without yeah. really, you know, it, I didn't set out to study it. I was just following the things that I really loved. So you put all these things together and swirl them together and, uh, and you've more or less got my origins and influences. And I've got to say, nothing's changed tremendously, although what happens is over the decades you mature and where you just start off trying to tell exciting stories that imitate what you've seen. Yeah. As you mature, you kind of discover that actually, you know, you, you do have personal themes, whether you realized it or not. Yes. And there are things that obsess, obsess you and there are things that have touched you very deeply that will emerge through your art uh, without you knowing it. And it's all there and it kind of bubbles up to the surface. And then as you, as you go along, you become in control of that and you become a little more conscious of it. Oh. So I hope that what I'm doing now is, um, is you know, more mature work than I did back then. But having said that, when I, when I look at some of the old stuff, I expect to find it reads quite naively. And the strange thing is it doesn't. Uh -huh. you know, and it, it reads like the writing of a stranger in some ways. A stranger who's had access to my my autobiography and, and a lot of my innermost thoughts and, and, and odd memories, you know, and, and I, I I'm always surprised by how much autobiography went into those stories when I was completely unconscious of it and I only recognise it afterwards. Well, it's interesting but, you talk about someone having access to your autobiography mm -hmm. and your memories. Now, I have to say your website is an absolute treasure trove of uh, writing tips and experiences and uh, emails and uh, synopses. Great swirling bucket of indiscretions. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and there's one particular quote that uh, mm -hmm. leapt out at me, really. Uh, and it was this, what drives me is the idea that we're actually living in a world that science fiction mapped out for us. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's so true, isn't it? I mean, you know, here we are with our mobile phones and our, um, our you know, our GPSs and our uh, on the horizon automatic cars and, you know, what we're doing right now. Yeah. I mean, imagine, imagine this pandemic without Zoom, without phones, without contact with, yeah. with each other. That's right. I mean, my daughter's down in London. She, she's living in Enfield. I haven't seen her since um, since February of last year. Yeah. And um, we have been continuously in contact through um, through text and uh, and phone and then a Zoom meeting, you know, once a week where we just set the whole thing up. In our, I have this thing called the apparatus, which is an old guitar stand with uh, with a clamp <laughs> um, gaffer tape to it that I can just Great. set the thing on. And then we... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we've... We kind of take that for granted, but it's it's um, it's Hayward Floyd talking to his daughter from uh, from the space shuttle in two thousand and one. Yeah, you know, and and what is it? You know, what what is it that you're saying over this? You, you know, she's showing him the new teddy bear or yes. whatever. Yes, you know, I've I've had a, a stream of um, of <laughs> of little texts and uh, and photographs over Signal this morning of the new puppy that they've got down there, and, <laughs> great, and so great. we're kind of participating from a distance. In a sense, I mean, the work I know is obviously October, I should explain. I had a very small part in October, and Charlotte uh, helped in the cutting room and was, was in All but vital. And, yes, you know, in, uh, in small but vital. That's right. While you were on the screen, you were holding the show up. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what I said to everybody on that show. You know, I mean, you know, you, you, you think you've just come in for a day part, but, you yeah, know, yeah, while you're... Yeah. Oh, you're on the screen. You're holding my entire show in the air. That's so very please. true. Very true. <laughs> and in fact, going back to your website, there's a whole stream of uh, thoughts and emails and uh, mm. uh, almost a diary of, of what it was like to to, to film October yeah. back in, what, 1995, 96? It was, maybe? let's see, it went out in 97. So it would have been kind yeah. of 96, 97 we were shooting. Uh, and Chimera, of course, is another one I certainly know, know you for. Uh, mm. Both of those sort of treated with uh, sort of themes of um, uh, genetic modification in a sense, didn't they? In that sense, do you think science fiction is a warning? Is that is that what you're using your writing as sometimes? I think it's an exercising of muscles. I mean, I did a thing at the Welcome Centre um, shortly after Chimera where um, it was me versus about five scientists. And the, um, the title of the talk was uh, Monster Myths Do Writers Demonise the New Genetics? Uh -huh. And uh, and I went along and I said, yeah, yeah we do. You know, that's yeah. our job. You know? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> there is, you know, there, there are there are sort of eternal myths enshrined in um, in these big important issues, mm. and people like me are always going to be making the connections between the two. And 
science fiction has been, you know, the, I think it was the 20th century's great medium for doing that. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure whether it's still the 21st century's ideal medium for doing that or whether we're moving into something, you know, less hard science based. Mm. You know, and I referred before to uh, Greg Benford's Timescape, more or less kind of sending me out of science fiction because I couldn't do that kind of thing. I'm wondering if it's coming full circle now to more of the kind of thing that I do, which is to emphasize the mythic side of it rather than the hard science side of it. Yeah, right. Now, the the Jerry Anderson universe specifically mm. deals more with a, an optimistic view of the future. Uh, yes. in, in all his, particularly his uh, supermarination series, you have your Thunderbirds mm. and Stingrays and so on. Uh, they tend to be um, organizations or, or families, of course, in the case of Thunderbirds, mm. who uh, come together to dedicate themselves and their hardware and their technology yeah. to saving people in peril. Mm. Did that ever appeal to you as a concept, uh, as a as a more as an out an outlook, perhaps, rather than the oh. darker paths that you've trodden? My arc with the uh, with the Anderson stuff. Um, my earliest memory is a Torchy the Battery Boy. I don't go back right. as far as Twinkle, but okay. I do have um, <laughs> a memory of Torchy the Battery Boy, but not a strong memory. Yes. The first real kind of TV love of my life was Four Feather Falls. Ah, um, interesting. Yeah, and um, I, you know, I'd have been really small. But then along came Supercar, and that was like, you know, you know those movies that um, start off in Academy format, and then the screen widens out, and you're in yes, cinema. Yes. Well, going from Four Feather Falls to Supercar was like that. Right. For me. Absolutely. And, and I absolutely loved Supercar, and um, I think it was the start of um, of a run of stuff with the Anderson things that. Um, I went from there to Thunderbirds, and then when we moved onwards after that to, like, Captain Scarlet and Joe 90 and Space 1999 UFO, that was kind of where it started leaving me. Okay. And, you know, yeah. I, I kind of have a high regard for them and a respect for them, but I didn't love, love, love those shows yeah. in the way that I did everything from Supercar to Thunderbirds. Yeah. And I think... There were a number of factors about that. It was the the ethos of the whole thing. It was the future that they showed was actually kind of a reassuring one. Mm. Because in most science fiction, when somebody writes about the future, they're writing about a dystopia. Mm. You know, and so much science fiction is dystopian. A lot of Doctor Who was dystopian because it was about terrible things happening in the future for the Doctor to fix. Mm -hmm. You know, survivors. You know, you name it. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've contributed. You've written for the ball. Yes. I can't say too much, <laughs> but you know, for for a, a child of whatever age I was, you know, moving up towards my teens, that kind of worldview was um, was was kind of stimulating and exciting and reassuring, and it was a future that you really wanted to live in. Yeah. And also, you know, those shows were beautiful. Yeah. To look at and everything else, and you know, when you see them restored on Blu-ray now, yeah. you know, you um. You're struck by it all over again. And the funny thing is, when you see behind the scenes stuff, they were all made by kind of women in twin, twin sets and blokes in duffel coats in, in drafty sheds somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely and yet, right. this fantastic future just contained within that small square. And just outside of that square was all this crap. Yes, <laughs> and, that's right. Absolutely. And bags and, and yeah. dust and yeah. <laughs> you know, scaffolding. Ashtrays, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you know, that's. Uh, it stayed with me even now. And I still think, you know, that the design for Supercar and the design for Stingray and some of the Thunderbirds models are some of the, uh, some of the you know, the most gorgeous pieces of sculpture that have ever been put on TV. Yeah. Photographed in the most kind of um, expert, expert manner. What a lovely man. Yeah. And I've yes. had a lovely yeah. snooze. I mean, I was listening intently, but I, I mean, instead of yeah, interviewing, I was having a lovely snooze. <laughs> No, it was great. Stephen was very approachable, very happy to talk about uh, his life and career, which is fascinating enough. Oh, and of yes. course, uh, his thoughts his thoughts on all things Jerry Anderson. And yeah, more next week. Guy. Yeah, more next week. And do you want to know the name of the part I played in, in October that he wrote and directed? Is there any way I could guess it without knowing it? <laughs> no, you'd never guess. Then please tell me. I had me. about three lines. Hay fever exec. <laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> classic. <laughs> Is that was that a uh, double barreled fever exec or was the hay fever the first name? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Yes, part two next week. Now, Jamie, don't get too relaxed because I've got something here that's really going to raise your heart rate. Oh, is it an espresso? No, nope, it's uh, one of these. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's time for another quick fire five. This one's courtesy of Mark Wilson over on our Facebook page. It's a Jerry Anderson vehicles quick fire five. Can't I just have an espresso? Ready? Okay. Number one. 
Thunderbird 1 or Angel Interceptor? Uh, oh, Thunderbird 1. Oh, Thunderbird 2 or Battlehawk? Oh, Thunderbird 2. Hey. Really? Yeah. Thunderbird 3 or UFO Interceptor? Uh, oh. Oh. Uh, oh. oh. Th- mm. Interceptor. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, okay. Thunderbird 4 or Stingray? Stingray, Stingray. Yeah, it's got to be, isn't it? And finally, Thunderbird 5 or Cloud Base? Uh, Thunderbird 5. I want to give Space a try. Ah, oh, okay. There we go. Well done. That's your Quick Fire 5 this week. Oh, that was good. nice. Yeah, yeah, because they were sort of the counterparts, weren't they? Thunderbird 5 and Cloud Base Absolutely. and Thunderbird 4 and Stingray. Nicely done, Mark. Thank you for those. Yeah, if you would like to uh, pitch your own idea for a Quick Fire 5, just simply post it on our Facebook group. Head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons and I might well see it there and use it next time. I look forward to those not. Please just send coffee instead. <laughs> You're doing an awful lot of looking forward, I've noticed. Oh, am I? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Do you never look back? Uh, no, it messes with your <laughs> neck. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, no, I, okay. I don't know what's going on. Who are you again? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> it says St. Michael in the back of a T-shirt. <laughs> I'll explain it then. Well, no, okay, fine. I uh, am um, uh, shaking with anticipation uh, <laughs> for a future... Quick fire five. How's that? Better? Great. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Oh, good. Right. What else is going on? Well, I have uh, got some YouTube comments, but uh, I would like to hear from Chris Dale because he's finished his carving over there on the wall. Look, nice, impressive. He's put some sort of little l- laurel wreaths around it as well, which looks very really nice. pretty. Yes. So let's hear from his randomizer, and then I'm going to head on over to YouTube and see what people have been saying about us over there. Perfect. All right, Chris Dale. Uh, over to you and your big red button. Come on, there must be something we can do. Oh, hello everyone. Sorry, we're in a bit of trouble by here. You see, the randomizer's given us the name of today's episode, but it's a title that was used in more than one show, and it hasn't given us the series name. Any luck with that yet, Jim? Come on. Come on, will ya? Oh, it's no use to keep mashing the button. What was the episode title again? Collision Course. Right, so it's either Lavender Castle or Space 1999, but we don't know which. It's, it's coming straight for us. But we still don't know what series it is. It's too late. Here she comes. Hang on! Oh no! Oh! Oh, so it was Space 1999. Not sure what all the fuss was about. Who was worried? I wasn't worried. Anyway, we're opening with the Alphans, uh, sending eagles out to destroy this uh, asteroid. I love these eagles with the uh, uh, carrying the, the nuclear charges, just the, the basic space frame with a great big hook underneath. Uh, Yes, welcome back to Space 1999 Season 1. We haven't been here since, uh, well, since Halloween, I believe, with uh, Force of Life. And I feel like Space 1999 probably isn't appearing as often as it perhaps statistically should, um, thanks to the the number of episodes. 48 episodes. We don't seem to be getting through them very quickly. I think this and uh, and Four Feather Falls aren't perhaps appearing as often as they they should, but uh, one's in trouble. it'll all be here before too long. The problem's in the main booster. Anyway, you won't be surprised to hear that Alan's eagle is broken. Gotta make it. We need twelve nuclear explosions to guarantee the chain reaction that will destroy the asteroid and avoid a collision. Mm. Using the timeline, Commander. Alan needs a minute. There's the uh, backstory. Ten seconds to get out. Before. I also noticed the very first shot of main mission. There was a, a, a boom mic quite visible in the top left corner of the screen. Later, blast forty seconds. Can't do it. We've got to destroy that asteroid. And timing's vital to avoid being caught in radiation from the blast ourselves. The later blast for forty seconds. And so here we have. Uh, Alan, we one of I think probably the earliest examples of. All the way, Commander. What I like to feel is Anderson. <sighs> Pushing back against critics that, um, Alan, with the live action shows that, uh, don't worry about perfection, just get in and get out. Though the stars of these shows, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're human, but they may as well be puppet for all the emotion they show. <laughs> Which I think he was always kind of aware of, and this is one of the first instances I think of him trying to, to fight back against that. I could be wrong, I, I possibly, probably even, he had no, uh, oh. The release mechanism's jammed! Something else on Alan's eagle is broken. Yep, yeah, probably he had nothing to do with this, but uh, here we have this scene of uh, you know, the asteroid hurtling towards the moon and Alan's stuck on it trying to get his uh, his nuke dropped. Got to have it there. Or else we'll all die. And Koenig is getting more and more distraught at the thought that uh, they might have to 
set the charges off before Alan can get clear, ultimately ending with him crying. Which some people have um, have criticised over the years. Ah, well, that's Alan's solution to uh, to the problem of the broken thing. If you break more stuff, then uh, it sort of balances everything out. Theoretically, the uh, the broken thing will become unbroken. Yeah, it. it it's it's an odd moment. I get what they're trying to do, but um, she's going. She's gone. I don't know that it really works to have Koenig in tears like this. I'm Maybe this is just something that Martin Landau brought. This, this was an idea all his own. Maybe this wasn't in the script. It's an interesting angle. Thirteen seconds. Thanks. But he's crying almost as if it was like Helena he was about to lose. Good luck. Red alert. You know, I don't think we'd see him crying like this over Paul or, or Carno. Or even Victor. So I don't know why Alan gets the uh Activate radiation screens. Gets the tears and the oh the the face palm there. Anyway. Four. Alan's clear? Three. Counting down to another big explosion. One. Activate. So we're back from the opening titles, and uh, yep, the asteroid has been successfully destroyed. We now have a lovely radiation cloud, as we have our episode titles. Screenplay Anthony Turpilov. Um, it's it, it was it's an exciting opening, actually. You know, being sort of thrown into a situation that we we don't really know anything about, and we have to discover. Come in, Eagle One. No, oh, he didn't stand a chance. Oh, thanks, Victor. It's more sections. Getting them now, sir. Oh, come in, Eagle One. Koenig still upset about losing his BFF. Alan, do you read me? Radiation screens at full power now. Full power confirmed. <gasps> Tanya dialogue confirmed. Must be grateful we got this far. Yeah, it, it, it's an it's an exciting opening. It's an interesting opening, but um. In Eagle One. I wonder about the size of the asteroid relative to the moon and relative to Alpha. Was it literally bearing down on the base? Sandra, I want a scanner report. Because that's that would be pretty unlucky for them. Radiation. What about the orbital satellites? Their transmissions cannot penetrate the radiation cloud. Why do we have orbital satellites? Medical section reports 14 casualties. Radiation? No. Conventional injuries only so far. Severed limbs and then the usual, you know, it's fine. Don't worry. Victor, if you're trying to tell me I made the wrong decision, tell me that. If you're trying to tell me that I'm wasting my time trying to reach Alan out there through that radiation cloud, tell me that. But if you're telling me that you don't think Alan is alive out there, I don't want to hear that. God, I love Alan this week. He's he's everything to me, Victor. Where is this coming from? Alan, can you hear me? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. I think I just spotted um the the legs of possibly a, a stand of, of some kind, possibly like a light reflector or something. There was like the legs of like a tripod or something were just visible in a shot there. Anyway, Koenig has had an idea. Pressing lots of buttons. Nobody knows what the heck he's doing, but he gets to do all this because he's the commander. There it is. We're still getting our own orbital satellite identification signal. Yes, but that is on the interstellar frequency band. Exactly, which Alan doesn't have. So it doesn't help him at all. We equip an eagle with one and send it up through that radiation cloud. We can establish three-way contact between it, Alan, and Alpha. Have there been any mention of orbital satellites around the moon before this? Or after even? I don't... Commander, we're at risk from radiation here in Alpha. This feels like it's something they've just invented for this episode. There's radiation screens and so do the eagles. It's effective against certain classes of radiation that we know about, but out there there's a kind of radiation we know nothing at all about. Victor... Shouldn't it just be nuclear radiation if you nuked it? Paul, what did he go on pair two? Nah, it's magic space radiation. I have four warning lights here for the secondary system. But they're minor. I say we disregard them. I agree. Otherwise, yeah, you can you can normally ignore warning lights on eagles. Generally, they're gonna be okay. You don't have many problems with these things. Yeah, I do like the um, the sort of clouds of space radiation and space dust on on some of these model shots. We have lift off. Visibility nil. No instruments. Visibility nil, and he has no idea where Alan is, or even if he is alive at all. It defies logic. Yeah. It's a thing called faith. 
Ooh, well, you're suddenly on board with the plan you weren't on board with a few minutes ago. That's also a shot of, uh, of Sandra there, uh, which appears in the opening titles, Xenia Merton um, knocking a prop lamp over, which is clearly, you know, a, a blooper, but um, because it's sudden, quick, exciting action, they put it in the this episode sequence in the titles. I always like it when they do things like that. Eagle One, do you copy? Oh, there's the great Lummox. Yep, he survived. Couple of cuts and scrapes. A lady whispering in his ear. But he's had worse. You're quite safe now. And I believe this is an episode that makes quite a lot of use of uh, old Joe 90 music. This is Joe 90 music here. Eagle One, do you copy? I think I said this is music that I, uh, when I was at university, I, I, I provided this for a, f a film that we did, and uh, luckily nobody queried where it came from. Hello, Alfred. Alfred, this is Eagle One. He's alive. Our wedding is still on. Oh, he's he's grinning like a little girl. Oh. Eagle Four, steer us to your position. I mean, I, I kind of get. It, it kind of fits the sort of long term arc of both seasons, you know, Alan being there right to the end. He's not receiving us. And by the end he is he is a a close buddy of Koenig's. But this just feels too early for this kind of he's at orbital reference. Three, four, nine. Obsession with Alan. Of course, computed and programmed. I haven't got his position yet. I have. Especially in the original UK broadcast order. I think this was broadcast as like episode four. Something ridiculous like that. There he is. Yay. Knocking, procedure checked and programmed. I like that they've gone to the trouble of um, scorching the the model of uh, Alan's eagle. It looks all uh, all blackened at the rear end, um, which makes sense because the explosion would have come from the rear as as Alan flew away. Yeah, where's that one, sixteen twelve? Where's a uh, slightly singed eagle from collision course? Well done, sir. You hold it steady. I'm going in there. And I'm going to be a while. I, I need some alone time with him. He's very dear to me, you know. There's some unusual angles on Alan here as he keeps hearing this uh, lady's voice. What's that he's seen? Oh. Suddenly he's somewhere else. Black cloaked figure. Bye bye. How is he? He's alive but unconscious. And beautiful. The effort of that docking must have been too much for him. Uh oh. My God. Commander. Commander, what's wrong? Commander. And how, this is something sort of very TV, rather than just saying what's wrong. Koenig doesn't reply, so Paul has to go over to the other eagle. Return to base. Why? Because there's another great big planet in the way. Only this time it's a planet. A massive planet. There's no getting away with this one, Paul. And that was some old supercar music, actually. How did Paul not notice that from his Eagle cockpit? But Koenig, well, Koenig, Koenig can sort out everything. He's the man, isn't he? Thanks, Paul. Stay with them till the medics arrive. Then report to my office. What was that little box that Koenig just checked? We're running out of time. He opened a little box. Oh, he still got it with him. Or is that like a black box recorder from the Eagle? Probably something I've waffled over. Victor, are we in trouble? Yes, but if you hadn't gone out there, we wouldn't have known anything about this planet till it hit us. We never would have known. Probably been better off. Well, I've been thinking. Oh, good. I've had today. Yay. How's that one? Clean as a whistle. No radiation. No radiation. What are we going to do about it? One thing's for sure, we won't be able to destroy it like we did the asteroid. No. My guess is it's 30 times the size of the moon. 34. And it is on a collision course. Impact will be in 105 hours and some 13 minutes from now. Hmm. I noticed actually, um, as Koenig entered main mission there, there was uh, a couple of people had uh, coffee cups around, but there was someone who had like a, a sort of orange plate with what looked like it might be uh, something bread or, or biscuity or a croissant on there. It's nice that they're allowed snacks in main mission while they're working. 
Anyway, Alan has been transferred to the medical centre. There's a, a, a female extra there, a nurse who's helping uh, lift him off the gurney, who I don't think you see again until season two, and then she's quite prominent in season two. She's like a prominent member of the command centre staff. Her name's Glenda Allen. How about this? Hmm? We alter our own trajectory by setting up a blast on the other side of the moon. We recreate by design the accident that originally blasted us out of the Earth's orbit. Save the planet the trouble by blowing ourselves up. We survived it once. By a miracle. Isn't that exactly what we're asking for? Fine, but don't ask computer to work it. Easy. And of course that was a solution that seemed to come up for a while in season two. It seemed to come up every other week. We'll just blow up these other nuclear waste dumps that we've never mentioned before. The, uh, the principle of Paul's suggestion is dead right. But I love all this. Victor with a, a, a dry white board or a, a big board he can draw a plan on. We make a force between ourselves and the planet. Another boom mic got into shot there as well. Clear charges like mines moored in space and make a shock wave between the moon and the planet which might force them apart, change their trajectory. Makes a lot of sense. It's okay when possibility. Victor suggests it because he's got a diagram and he makes convincing hand gestures. Sandra, what have you learned about the planet? It has an atmosphere, but it is not ideal. Temperatures range from a high of approximately 10 degrees centigrade to minus 30. So it is almost certain that some kind of life could exist there. Yeah. Question is, what kind of life? We'll bombard that planet with every kind of communication we can devise. Paul, you've overlooked something. That includes semaphore, Paul. You're going to have someone out on the surface with semaphore flags. This comes from the onboard computers on my eagle. If we want to glean more information from that planet, it means a reconnaissance flight. That means me going alone, because I'm so damn heroic. The question is, can that planet withstand a collision with the moon? Oof. How long is a piece of string? Well, I think I know, Victor. You see... I'm going to go out there and take a look at that planet. Meantime, you start Operation Shockwave. If I find that planet's habitable, we'll have to make a spot decision as to whether we chance an evacuation. And of course, I'm going along because I'm so damn heroic. Oh, Alan's got a visitor again. Who are you? A friend. I wonder if this is Margaret Layton in this scene. If um, I gather she wasn't too well, and um, I can't imagine they, they would have wanted to move her out of that throne to have her standing around in medical center like this. Why have you come to me? I like the reveal of this, though. Where have you come from? You are quite safe now. Who are you? I mean, it looks like it could be Barbara Bain under that sheet, which would make sense considering what we're about to discover, but it looks slightly too old. Who are you? But it doesn't look like Margaret Leighton either. But of course it really is. Um. Oh. Where are you? Come back! Don't leave me now. Nurse. Take me with you. Oh. Take me to your people! <laughs> oh, Hysterical Alan is funny. I also remember when this episode was shown on uh, ITV4 in the UK. It um, They cut the beginning of that sequence. Everything with Ara was cut and it just went straight to that Oh, where are you? What's going on? From Alan, which made it even funnier. That was no nightmare. Now how the hell can you be so sure? Because I know my job. Look, except for Alan, both you and Paul have had the greatest exposure. Look, I'm not hallucinating. Okay, maybe maybe my reaction was a bit hasty, but so is your assessment. My ass That's love for you, Helena. I love Alan. Look, I think he has been affected. And if I'm right, then you've got to be suspect Now, too. look, Helena. Yes, Paul? Reconnaissance Eagle ready on pad four. Co-pilot Pierre Daniel is standing by. Thanks, Paul, but I'm going alone. You're not going out again. Not without co-pilot Pierre Daniel. Oh, it's a rather flamboyantly named character that we never actually get to meet because, of course, Koenig has to go off and do the whole thing by himself. Main mission, this is Koenig calling on interstellar frequency. How do you read? Very loud and very clear. Which I know has to, has to be the way it is in order for the rest of the plot to function as it does, but... How's Operation Shockwave coming along? It is. It does get rather tiring that there's nobody on this show who ever says, hey, you're the commander. Your job is supposed to be to stay here. We have other competent Eagle pilots. Um, Position. Alpha main none of them have names as yet, but uh, they do exist. Anyway, Koenig is approaching the nice yellow blobby planet. Ooh. What's this coming towards him? 
Well, it's a spaceship model that looks uh, we read you, Commander. rather like the uh, the NASA space shuttle. I'm a spaceship heading right towards me. Tremendous velocity. I'm taking evasive action. I'm I'm gonna wobble the ship a bit. Oh, the wobbling is having no effect. Why doesn't he open fire? It's strong enough to drag him towards it. It could be strong enough to stop his lasers. It's a very nice. Uh, spaceship model this. It does look a bit like the, the old space shuttle and uh, it's got this beak thing on the front that opens up and swallows his eagle whole. Secret service music there. We're, Barry Gray was uh, was digging through his old uh, music library with this one. There's a slim chance he may have survived even inside that other ship. So we can't attack. Operation Shockwave, do we go on with it? Oh, we must at least go on with the preparations. Moonbase Alpha, do you read me? So Koenig's Eagle is now aboard the alien spaceship. All power seems to have gone. Main mission, this is Koenig, do you read me? Do you read me? But something makes the door open of its own accord, which is rather sinister. I like, I like actually how effectively creepy the Eagle looks when, uh, when all the lights are turned out like this. Especially because the door opened really slowly there. And this is more old Joe 90 music, which I believe has been slowed down um, for this scene. Which I suppose helps make it creepier. It's a, it's a familiar piece of music to, to us longtime fans, given a, a slightly unfamiliar twist. Koenig has now been locked out of the Eagle. Off to explore the spaceship. Which has a lot of cobwebs around. So maybe it's a ship they don't use very often. And here we are in uh, the throne room. Again, lots of cobwebs all over the place. It's, uh, it's a bit Miss Havisham-y. But uh, it's not as important as who's that shadowy figure at the far end of the room. And much of this room, particularly this uh, this throne of ours, was reused. Um, I think in the second series, this is uh, the uh, the Archon Patrick Troughton's character in the Dorcons uses this throne as well. It's much cleaner when he has it. Is there not not as many cobwebs on it? And here we get our first full proper glimpse of Margaret Layton, who I gather was... I have waited a long time to meet you, John Koenig. Was rather unwell when this was filmed, um, and she didn't really know what she was saying. She just went in and said it. Etheria. The planet whose course has so terrified you and your people. But it kind of works. I, I like the sort of sadness. I expected you of this character but also there's there's a bit of venom and a bit of uh see your destiny has always been our destiny a bit of well that kind of talk as well a bit of mystical nonsense thrown in oh poor john koenig how you belittle yourself in the scheme of things and yet how small you are to be so great i thank you I should very much like to know my place in the scheme of things. Particularly my greatness. Our two planets. I've always suspected it, but it's nice to have it confirmed. of time for the great purpose of mutation. We shall change utterly. You and I are two vital drops in the boundless ocean of time. I can see why Margaret Layton would struggle with a lot of this dialogue, because it is... It is very vague, it is very flowery, it is very, um, well, a lot of it is just nonsense. Question of the destiny of man. Although this is nice. Please be more specific. What will happen to us? You shall continue on. Your odyssey shall know no end. You will prosper and increase in new worlds, new galaxies. 
audio series. Populate the deepest reaches of space. Yeah, I love all that. I, I really love that stuff. It has more weight to it than uh, than a lot of the other things she says. The gene of which I and my people are a part shall mutate. We shall become immutable for time inconceivable. And what must I do to help you achieve all of this? Nothing. I'm afraid I'm right. As always, or not, of course I don't get much credit around here, but... ...in the exact position where we plan to lay our minds and create shockwaves. Tanya. Give all cargo carrying eagles lift off clearance. Yes, Paul. More Tanya dialogue. Go inside that alien spaceship. There's no need to state the obvious. But it's all I can do if, if I'm not in medical center, I have to state the obvious. Oh, now Helen is sad. Everybody's sad. Even Paul's mustache is sad. Main mission to all cargo eagles. Move towards the alien spaceship. Coordinates for the nuclear charges will be transmitted shortly. No other way. Not that I know of. More old Joe 90 music. This is great. I love it. Mid, this sort of mid, mid-series mid period of the first season of Space 1999 where Barry Gray suddenly discovers all this old music he has and decides that uh, he's going to plaster it all over all this. Your friends are dangerously concerned about you. They are making elaborate plans which could destroy this ship. They must do nothing. Are you asking me to tell them to do nothing? How can I do that? They need facts, logical explanations. They're all, all of them, logical men and women. What you tell me sounds magnificent here, in this chamber and from your lips. But how will it sound of the cold light of Moonbase Alpha? They'll never believe me. They already think I'm suffering from radiation sickness. They simply will not believe me. That is the test of your command. Uh-oh. Are you unfit to play the part for which you have been destined since the beginning of time? Well... I have faith in you, John Koenig. Oh, here's a, here's a line. Here's a line. But what is faith against the fact of imminent collision? I hate that line and I don't know why. I'll need to know more. I, I'll need to know what you are going to do. This one's better, though. I go to shape the future of eternity, and I need your help. So that's the end of our meeting with Ara, and um, yeah, I... That's just thrown a sort of massive spanner into everything regarding the rest of, of this episode. Uh, you know, putting aside the, the you know, our planet crashing into your moon don't worry everything's going to be fine okay can just about buy that but um expecting him to be able to convince everybody she stubbornly refuses to assist in any way in that front you know if she you know if she could just record like a quick video message on his com lock possibly shape the future of eternity just saying hi alphans you know Gonna gonna have a bit of a collision, but it's okay. And here's here's how it's gonna be okay. Um, this is just kind of from this point on. It's it's all so nebulous and tenuous. And unfortunately, that that problem only increases from here. Main mission. Main mission. This is Koenig. Suspend all operations immediately. Cancel Operation Shockwave. Pull those eagles out of there. And most important, do nothing until I return. Repeat, nothing until I return. Yes, sir. So now we come to a point in the story which I actually don't hear many people raise at all. We're now at the uh, the sort of meeting table in the commander's office, and everyone's like, "Oh, this whole Lara thing. Don't buy any of this." But um, here's here's the thing. I know it's incredible. They all saw the spaceship. Commander, the radiation cloud has cleared now. The readings we are getting are accurate. David has double-checked them with the computer, and the fact is we are going to collide with that planet in less than seven hours. Now, if you know anything about science, as I do, you will know that spaceships do not occur naturally. 
somebody has to actually construct them. Commander, it's an open and shut case. We either make some attempt to save ourselves or we die. Now all the Alphans in main mission saw the spaceship. They all accepted that is a spaceship and the commander has been taken aboard it. I don't know. You don't know. But the idea that he spoke to someone while he was on there. Two constant factors. That is just unbelievable. We survived them all. That is just, you know, you, you don't go aboard a spaceship and expect to talk to people because, you know, people don't exist on spaceships. People don't build spaceships in order to go out into space aboard those spaceships. Spaceships are just apparently this, this thing that just randomly pop into existence. And I find that so infuriating with this. You're beginning to talk like a computer. And now we have this bit with, with Helena and, and Victor sort of pretending to side with, with Koenig, but really they're not. But it's just that... But then the commander's case is not based on reason or fact, but on faith. What is their thought process regarding the origins of the spaceship? But you set up Operation Shockwave. Yes, I did. And now I believe it should be cancelled. They know that... People, people have to build spaceships, but the idea that there was a person on that spaceship is more than any of them can handle. And it's more than I can handle their response to it. I don't get it. Now there's a brown rug on the floor. Paul. This is an episode for spotting a lot of uh, I have to take over now. technical slip-ups and whatnots. Hallucination, disorient. Yeah, the, the, the Alphans reaction to the spaceship just baffles me. I, I need to understand their thought processes regarding it's going to have to be confined to his quarters. why it's so unbelievable that Koenig would have met someone on the spaceship, regardless of what he says that person tell, told him to do. Six hours and 32 minutes. It's, it's not even mentioned. It's just, you know, absolutely impossible. Security. Security. It's, it doesn't track with, you know, they all saw the spaceship. That They just can't get their heads around the idea that there was someone on it. I don't understand. Anyway, I've basically waffled all over there. Um, Operation Shockwave is still on. Uh, Helena has had Koenig knocked out and uh, locked in his quarters by security. Because nobody believes poor old Koenig. And meanwhile, the Alphans have laid their explosive charges to, uh, well, to create their little shockwave. No mention of their poor old uh, orbital satellites. But, uh, ah, Victor stopped to... Uh, to give Kate uh, an affectionate pat on the shoulder and Kate was a, a prominent character in well not prominent but she was in she was more prominently featured in the second season than she was in the first played by Sarah Bullen it's nice that she got a bit of uh, a bit of business there activate radiation shields to medium power well, quite a few people look like they've got plates of food around now it looks like there's um, all launch pads some toast we might have had some toast and decompress yes sir nuclear charges Ready to That's it. Paul's got a big magic button to uh, set the charges Your going. Have betrayed you, John Koenig. Betrayed. Again, it, it's nice, you know, it's nice that we have Koenig and, and, and Carter against the rest of Alpha, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if she just turned up on the big screen in main mission and said, Hi, guys, so here's the deal. This is what's going to happen. And um, this is why you need to do nothing. We're all on the same page now? Okay, right. Thanks, thanks for helping us out with this. But, no. And, I mean, I am not going to claim to be any master on writing anything by any means. If any of you have heard any of my Terrorhawks episodes, you will know this to be true, that I am not the greatest writer in the universe. But, it, it gets to the point where, you know, the story is just, it's just kind of broken. Speaking of broken. And this is... We're going on to a different subject here. From this point on in the episode, Koenig is escaping from his quarters. We seem to have, and it's it's there on every single copy of this episode that I have ever seen, an extra sound effects track running slightly ahead of the main action. You heard it there just as Koenig ran towards his door. You heard the sound of running footsteps before he even left, and you'll hear it not consistently throughout the rest of the episode, but there are a few more footsteps before people walk kind of moments um things explode before they actually explode kind of moments and it's just a probably just a uh, a goof in the editing room somewhere that an extra sound effects track got added Dr. somewhere but um 
Yeah, th did you hear it there? That was Alan opening the door before he opened the door with his com lock. And, um... She called. Where is she? Although it's 99% it's likely to be just a, a goof in the editing room, I like it kind of fits with this episode, the ideas of, you know, destiny and, and so on and so forth, that, uh, you know, you're hearing what's going to happen before it happens. I rather like it. Clear trigger. It wouldn't work in any other episode, but somehow it really fits here. So, Alan and uh, Koenig have teamed up in their pyjamas. Everyone in main mission is very worried. Particularly... Brunette extra in a yellow sleeve that we've never seen before. She's gonna run. It's too much for her to take. I don't know who she is. I have a feeling she's in one or two more episodes, but... Uh, there it was again. You see that? You heard the sound of Alan throwing the cabinet or whatever it was before he actually did it. Oh, it's so strange. Tanya, get away from that button. <gasps> oh, yes. Close and lock main mission doors. That's a line I'd like on a t-shirt. Tanya, get away from that button. Another boom mic? Are you kidding me? Two minutes Just as time. Helena and Matthias arrive before the doors are locked. Where is Ara? Just with her people on the planet of Theria. They're waiting for our two worlds to touch. When that happens, they'll be transformed into a higher form of life. Or dead. Oh, Victor's still comforting the uh, the brunette lady. Chance of survival. Operation Shockwave will destroy us unless we wait and do nothing. John. Oh, there's the boom mic. Ah, very slowly worked its way out of shot. But you couldn't deceive Aura. Operation Shockwave will not take place. Then we'll die for certain. I, I admire this show for uh, reducing its main character to uh, pull increasing rapidly now. We must detonate. A maniac ranting his in his pajamas on more than one occasion. John, I'm not sure it's perhaps it's healthy for the show, but I, I admire it. You think I'm suffering for radiation sickness, don't you? Both you and Alan. There was a radiation. Ara saved Alan, just as she'll save all of us. Believe in the Church of Ara. The medical facts. Helen, why don't you believe me? And again, it's 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 an odd um, link back to the beginning of the episode where uh, John was worried he's going to lose his man crush, Alan, and now they're sort of psychically linked. Both agents of Ara. I don't know if you were the sort of person you could read subtext into these things. You know, these two men, their unrequited love, and now they're bound together for, for reasons of destiny or whatever. Oh, I'm rambling. But this is a kind of rambly kind of episode. We're one minute away from the uh, detonation, Operation Shockwave. No word on what that will do to all those satellites they apparently have. And, and it is a sort of bold way to resolve an episode. You know, our heroes, you know, our main character is saying, just do nothing, absolutely nothing. And everyone else is like, now hang on, if we do nothing, we're going to die. We're all going to die in a minute. Yeah. I'll take my chance a few seconds early. But I, I just don't think this comes off. If you choose. More pre-sound effects there. Ah! Of the guy jumping off the main mission balcony. <coughs> Ooh, even Victor's getting involved in a fight here. And Paul. Oh. Carno's going to rush forward to press the button. Oh, no, he's going to help restrain Koenig. No! <coughs> Helen has got the choice. Does she believe Koenig or go for the button? Button wins. But it's too late to do anything. Yep. So, that's that then. The planet now bearing down on Alpha. I love it just filling the screen and everyone's silent. Backing away from the big screen. I'm not sure what they think... Uh, that's going to do for them. Ara, where are you? Victor, I believe you, Victor, I believe that! Yeah, well, you're a maniac ranting in his pyjamas. I, I, I like as well that actually nobody sort of calls Koenig out on the fact that he is hysterical. Um, nobody says anything. And more pre-sound effects. There we go. Explosions before the explosions happened. Very strange, but very fitting. 
And that's it. The moon has passed through planet Etheria. That's gone. So, whatever was going to happen, evidently happened. And now we've got to put these fires out before it uh, burns anyone's toast. Medical section, prepare to receive casualties. So, I mean, how do you wrap up an episode like this? The the plot the plot was so vague and so unusual that you can't really have a sort of oh I don't know I I'm really torn about my feelings on this one and I'm worried that uh, I'm sorry I'm worried that I I don't enjoy it enough right totally right if you don't but on the other hand I'm also worried that I enjoy it in spite of its flaws Helena. If you went out to that spaceship and came back with a crazy story like I did, I'd be a fool not to lock you up. The idea of a person being on a spaceship, it's ludicrous. But a planet on a collision course would not collide. would simply touch. Yeah, because ultimately it means nothing. Um, which, you know, I, I can accept a lot of that in this series, but uh, this episode, my goodness, this episode really stretches the... Um, the, the credibility factor so that was collision course and oh i want to like it more than i do it's not a bad episode it's just one of those episodes i wish i could pick up and give a sh give it a bit of a shake and see if if things landed slightly differently landed in a way that makes more sense because there's some really good stuff in here but there's also a lot of stuff that just makes no sense particularly once arrow shows up it's just headache inducing problems that uh, kind of work against this one throughout quite a bit of it unfortunately Ooh. space 1999 which we've been talking about a lot recently because of the oh, well, it's, big finish yeah. uh, volume uh -huh. one uh, audio thing and all and that not, yeah not only that it is fantastic and oh, yeah, nice to too. have it back in the randomizer yeah yeah yes, thanks time. chris lovely stuff yeah yeah, and some uh, rather lovely uh, Martin Bauer uh, model work in there, which uh, is rather good in the, um, which comes back later for Dragon's Domain in the graveyard, I believe, okay. in the ship graveyard. Yeah. Anyway, mm, thank good. you, Chris. More randomizer next week, obviously, because it's an integral part. In fact, one might say, some might say, <laughs> the best part of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Well, yes. So it good, really in fact, the... yeah. mm -hmm. that it's got its own podcast. Yes. If you'd like to relive episodes of the Jerry Hansen Randomizer without Richard and I spoiling it, then you can just search Jerry Hansen Randomizer on your <laughs> podcast app of choice and subscribe there and listen to one a week on a Sunday where Chris started from the very beginning and is probably about what, 40 episodes in by now, 30 episodes. He's yes. doing pretty well anyway. Enjoy. Yes. Great. Uh, now, I did head on over to YouTube to see what people were saying about Pod 144. Oh, there's uh, always some, ago. some great ones mm. on YouTube, aren't yes. there? No, no, this is very nice. Keith, for example, says, uh, another great episode of the Jerry Anderson podcast with all the usual banter. I love the way they call it banter. That's what it is. Uh, between Richard and Jamie. Uh, great interview by Ben Page with David Hirsch, says yes, Keith. well done, who Ben. I'm ashamed. Yeah, he says, I'm ashamed to say I'd never heard of him before, but his connections to the universe, or, uh, although tenuous, were surprisingly interesting. Yes, just the way we <laughs> like it. He says, I look forward to part two next week. Uh, also looking forward to Jerry Anderson Day on the 14th of April. Chris Dale's randomizer review of one of my favourite Stingray episodes, The Lighthouse Dwellers, was especially enjoyable. And I also liked Jamie's brief Robert the Robot impersonation. Oh, thank right you. Right at the tail end of the podcast. Thank you, thank you. I wonder, he says, if that is significant. Um, I mean, Keep I couldn't good possibly say if it was significant or not. No. Right, OK. Uh, Ian says, can't wait to, uh, for part two of the interview with David Hirsch. Yeah, well, you would have heard that by now, Ian. He says his own insight into working with Jerry Anderson is very fascinating. And heading right back to, well, I say right back, to pod 143 uh, the week before, which featured an interview with Richard Harvey. Uh, Darren posted, I was so thrilled when I saw that Richard was involved with Firestorm. When I first heard the theme, I thought, oh, that sounds like a Harvey piece. And then I saw his <laughs> credit and I was so happy. And finally, OD posted, hope and pray that these podcasts continue for decades to come. <laughs> I mean, well, there you go. Careful, Looks like we're tied in now. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, it's always worth looking, you know, beneath the line on some of those YouTube videos because some of them are very nice. Yes. So I shall endeavour to pick the choice ones and uh, maybe read them out in, in a future podcast. Oh, yes. Brilliant. Do, are you do looking forward to that? that? I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, also, if you would like to, please do leave a review on our on our podcast on Apple Podcasts oh. or any of the other podcast yeah. providers. But yeah, you yeah. know, a lot of you are on Apple Podcasts. So have a have a mm. uh, have a look at the lovely reviews there. There's 
you know, mostly four and five stars. Only only a couple ah. of one star reviews. And uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think they may have been left by a rival podcast, <clears throat> Benji and Nick Show. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, there you go. Lovely comments. Thank you yeah. very much for looking those up, uh, Dickie, and for leaving the Postrons. Now, have we got anything else for this particular podcast, number 146, or are we pretty much done? I think I'll leave the best bits for 147. Good. As always, it, we thought it would be. Yeah. If you are going to join us for Jerry Anderson Day, please email us, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, or tweet us with the hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast and the hashtag Jerry Anderson Day, and tag mm. him, Richard N. James, me, I'm Jerry Anderson, or him over there, Chris Dalek. Uh, let yeah. us know well what you're going to be doing with Jerry Anderson Day but until pod 147 which will be the week before the Jerry Anderson Day episode oh, right then we should probably say goodbye yeah oh, goodbye goodbye Let's go. Spectrum is green. Well, Richard James. Yes. I know you've got some work to be doing for uh, well, for Jerry Anderson yeah. Day for the secret thing, but I, I um, have now that I know that Fab Live is going to be ninety minutes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, who do you think we should try and get as guests? Obviously, Nick Briggs. Oh, obviously, Nick Briggs. Uh, I don't know who's been involved in the Jerry Anderson universe recently. Well, John Coleshaw has been doing those fantastic tech talks, hasn't he? Would he yeah, be available? Do you maybe think? we should talk to John. See if that would be fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I bet Lou Hur should love to dip in and tell us what he thinks. Oh yes, nobody would love that more. <laughs> Uh, mm. The ghost of Des O'Connor. Um, we should invite him. Yeah, uh, and definitely a dog or two. I think. Yeah, well, I can pretty much guarantee that the bad breath hound will be joining us too. <laughs> and that wasn't an insult towards Nick Briggs. Oh, oh, ouch! Well, if I they will leave that. us one-star reviews, then uh, what do they expect? <laughs> uh, right, uh, you go and get on with your day. You've got lots of prep to do yep. for Fab Live, yeah, and um, I I've got another nap to have. So uh, bye. Oh, uh, well, hang on a minute. <clears throat> All right, then. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.